Hello and welcome to Football Is Nice, a Russell Brand podcast with Gareth Roy and Jenny May Finn in which we talk about the nice side of football. some of the challenges that emerge from football using a broad cultural analytic lens. I don't know if it's a broad lens, it's a wide lens, it's a large lens, it's a fisheye lens. We've got guests. We have Ben Foster on today. We read out your reviews. We talk about results. We do predictions. We read your tweets. You should watch this on YouTube or listen to it wherever you listen to your podcast. And for God's sake, give it a review because uh, I love to be reviewed. Only five star reviews, you understand. It's not that I'm interested in objectivity why would i would be why would i be why would i care about objectivity in such a niche area of my life we've got some great things coming up for you on the show today leave it a review like these people have done for example a man like cam says this podcast is nice been a fan of russell for years and years also been a fan of football for years and years if you'd like either check out this podcast my dream is Cantona comes on the podcast imagine russell and eric in conversation we would all be flies to wanton boys oh as flies to wanton boys are we um obviously we love that documentary about the early years of the prem on bbc iPlayer. gareth seems to be sponsored by i, I love that bit where it, the eric Cantona bit right where he goes um he said there's this bit where they asked him a question about like the sort of the passion of football and all this kind of thing and he just goes i cannot stand the i just cannot the only thing i cannot stand is emptiness i cannot stand the emptiness he looked at camera but bloody hell <laughs> it's a bit heavy eric he's profound isn't it he is profound but is it like cardinal burns's portrayal of banksy like well, I, well i've done this it's a copper kissing a just kissing a black villa done it to amuse myself more than anything else is it like that it's only in the context of football that he yeah. seems arty or is he arty in general certainly he's smoldering and in in te- as intense as hell let's get cantona oh let's get cantona on here Imagine having him on here, like just being like, we're, we're telling him that we've got jingles about him. We're telling him that he's a dog. <laughs> we'll get him on. We've got a jingle. Listen, Kent, and I, we've got a jingle about you. Get yourself on here. Yeah, I just thought that was a very sort of intense Did and poetic thing to Did you enjoy the, the episode, the latest, episode three? Focused a lot on Keith Gillespie's gambling. You did. And the sort of, and as Paul Merson called it, the sliding doors mm. element when winger uh, Gillespie went one way so that Andy Cole could go to United. And it, I felt, really felt for him because he looked like a sort of a wide-eyed, pie-eyed youngster all full yeah. of portent. And like you can see, it would be a trauma for him to be sort of suddenly sold in that way. And it, yeah, it made me recognise the brutal side of football that are like, a, like players are nurtured, held up from childhood, like that you're nurtured and you're in this environment, but it's so conditional and you can just be dispensed with just so easily yeah it, it, it was it wasn't exactly tragic necessarily to say with gillespie because obviously he had you know he, he had uh he, he was fantastic at united and brilliant at newcastle also but obviously he's not one that you look back and say he's one of the greats although it looked like he had that ability i know beckham and neville talked about him like he was up there with gigs didn't they yeah um it made me think obviously the tragedy of the, of the kind of gambling side of life and obviously it must have taken a lot out of him the kind of what he was hiding all the whole time um and how difficult that must have been for him and the effect that that may have had on his career but also i thought about you know in this documentary these footballers are looking back on the highlights aren't they and they're looking back on some of the greatest moments from their lives and i guess with all of us there must be a way in which you know for them they're looking back on these moments that at the time they must have thought well this is just what this is just life this just happens week to week and now they look back and there are defining moments in their careers that are the things that people remember and maybe the the only things that these people be remembered for and i thought it must be very strange as a footballer it must just all go so quickly and then you look back and to have your kind of life and career not necessarily reduced to but certainly summed up in a series of highlights And, you know, if you've had a great career, you have a long highlights reel. And if you didn't have necessarily what we would have deemed a great career, such as Keith Gillespie, you have a few moments. And I think that must be quite difficult to deal with. It must be because you know what your inner life is. You know your own complexity. And here you are objectified mm. in that manner. But when the seagulls, when the seagulls... When the seagulls follow the trawler, it's because they sink sardines will be strong into the sea.
It was so good the way he did that press conference, wasn't it? Like he was so what an aloof dude mm-hmm. Eric Cantona was that he would just sort of turn out and behave in that manner. What a character. We love charisma. The other thing I got from it is David Janola was so sexually attractive. Yeah. It was almost like um, a free will detonator. Yeah. Like I think I would just like like kiss him if I saw him. Him and Denise Van Alten were just making innuendos that I didn't even know were innuendos. Of yeah, a- anything they said was like, you know what I mean by that, don't you? Yes, I do, because I am David Janola <laughs> and I'm always on the precipice of sex. Well, the innuendo in particular that they were saying was, you know, what's it like when your balls hit the back of the net? Yeah. I mean, or I think we all know what balls are, but what's the back of the net in this innuendo? Yeah. The taint, the perineum, I think somebody's they, buttocks. They basically just wanted to flirt, didn't they? And they were using innuendo as a vehicle for flirting. The other thing I thought from that episode three was, isn't it strange when Newcastle, I mean, they're such a funny team. They're a funny team now uh, for different reasons. And obviously a lot of that episode was about the kind of hope and the kind of regeneration of that club on under Keegan. But the way in which, and, and obviously that you hear lots of things about Keegan, and we've talked about Keegan's tactics being about basically them playing five-a-side football. But the way that he sold Andy Cole to United, and um, you just kind of think, why did they do, do that? that? It's a bit like, I suppose, Cantor, you, you know, you could you could say that Man United were kind of very shrewd operators, which of course, of course, lots of people would say. But in, in the um, transfers of Cantona and Andy Cole, they got two of their you know, best ever strikers. And, and they made from their rival opponents teams. worse. Yeah, like Leeds, you know, had, had recently won the title. Uh, Newcastle were up there, you know, certainly in terms of their, you know, their biggest title contenders alongside United. And they nicked their two best strikers. Yeah. It's kind of amazing that that happened. He was so good at their mind games. He was. He loved a mind game. Yeah. Uh, you got to watch out. Now, listen, um, review this show. I'm telling you to. I'm asking you to. I, I love to see a review. Sports as Transcendental, says Brandon Pestano. is a long-term listener of Under the Skin. I always like the moments where Russell spoke about West Ham and thought to myself, it would be great if he spoke more about football. Well, here we are. What other sport could stop two opposing armies fighting on Christmas Day in the deadliest war in history? Well, this is good. Sport in general is something which, even if it can be tribal, has the capacity to transcend cultural and and social norms and unify. Tyson Fury coming back from the brink of suicide to become a world champion. There are thousands of these stories that couldn't be scripted, and yet they happen. Long live sports, and most importantly, football. Why? Because football is nice. Great review. Five stars there, Brandon. And we're giving your review five stars. I've decided I'm going to review reviews views nice keep the circle the circle of life in motion i mean when we talked about west ham's result against manchester united at the weekend like that's what i said was is like how can anything so powerful and operatic even emerge culturally it what i suppose football does is it provides a framework in which events can happen that sometimes you know we've all watched games it's a, oh, it's a draw it's a bit boring it's a win as anticipated but like as a west ham fan it seems to me like and i'm sure your experience as a whole fan is comparable it seems to me that in particular there is some loric consciousness working its way through the club whether it's in the sort of a uh, triumvirate of 1966 heroes forever tied to the apex of england's sporting achievement that world cup win with peters hurst and more that statue still stands at the old cathedral of upton park or like whether it's like in the more micro and the more local this result where west ham go up there's a bit of a shaky goal a deflection then the 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 equaliser from Ronaldo, a tap in, and like just him, just a, a sort of a, a monolith, a Goliath, a living statue, a living sign, a, a sort of a breathing idol, and 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 then for Lingard to come on to a round of applause and then score exactly the type of goal that he was scoring when he was on loan at West Ham yeah. last season. That moment, like you know, I'm just on my settee on my own at home having my breath taken away and it's like in the 88th minute the game's nearly over then West Ham get a penalty in the 90th minute then Noble comes on the captain Mark Noble beloved the spirit of the club the longest serving player one club hero Mark Noble scored 10 in 10 penalties 10 in 10 in the 91st minute in order to get a point because also the 80th minute by the way is that sort of point in the game where I started to think like wow we ain't got Antonio because he's injured we don't have Lingard anymore like 
our West Ham in trouble. You know, a point now would be good. A point would be good. And then Lingard's got, and then that involves, and then Mark Noble misses that penalty. I'm like standing up in my in my own house with my top off, roaring. It sort of it accesses something in you. It gives you permission to feel certain things. I think like that's where the ticket price is well worth it. You know, and you can get pretty good deals at the London Stadium, actually. <laughs> um, but that's because we didn't pay for it. <laughs> but, but, but like, um, you know, it's sort of. Uh, like that it's what where else are you going to get that feeling like you know it's been a long time since i've seen a film maybe like rocky four or something where i've like watched the film and gone no i'm not having this or like you know populist entertainment can do it like mm. love island i can remember like when i was watching it a couple of seasons ago going this is ridiculous you know it's so weird but like football i think uniquely is accessing it, like that's where i was thinking you know football is not nice there football is an invitation <laughs> to really confront some dark feelings of failure and disappointment and sadness and w- hope warped and dashed i also for me it was um obviously i wasn't as uh, connected to it as as you were but um obviously all those the, you know what you just mentioned lingard coming on scoring a, a typical lingard west ham version of lingard goal yeah you can see how superstitions uh, occur so often in football because yeah. it football is constantly writing its own narratives you know yeah. that that of course that someone would would have superstitions about well this is bound to happen because it frequently does happen you know it's not a surprise that people then go well i can only watch this if i do these certain things and sit in this certain seat and you know do that because it's gonna happen you feel a feeling when you see lingard warm up yep right you feel a feeling and that feeling is oh there's just lingard i hope he doesn't come on and (laughs) score a goal yeah and you feel a feeling when mark no i mean it's gonna give you outcomes i suppose that's what sport does and like whether the outcome was oh lingard didn't score that's obviously less interesting or noble did score that's still a narrative that's still a story it's still powerful and you're right you feel like you want to influence it i'm reading a book at the moment that is saying it's it's a bit in that territory of you manifest your reality cosmic ordering type thing but it's not quite that it's sort of saying your inner life is creating your reality and you can kind of see how your beliefs are the the thousand micro differences that will occur if your fundamental belief is things don't turn out well for me every interaction is going to be affected by that and it's going to bias you if you're going through life with your chest out and you know your lungs full of breath and breathing and believing and breathing in yourself it's going to affect the kind of outcomes that come your way i mean if your chest is out too far people are going to think you're some sort of nitwit but i'm just saying attitude creates reality otherwise what is a positive influence what is charisma what is the power of a manager why is it that immediately that ferguson leaves the same group of players become mediocre because he somehow Right, like um, elevated them to a higher frequency and held them there through belief. You are what I tell you you are. Because in a sense, from a rational, materialistic perspective, you know, what is it really? A shirt, a stadium, a group of people, the words Manchester United. You could dissemble it into almost nothing, couldn't you? Like, you know, now you get some fans who f- are fans of a player. You know, mm. like I'm a fan of Mbappe or Ronaldo and you'll just sort of follow them wherever they go as a fan. You know, like it's not anchored in the location and the sort of set of signs around the club like this is where they play and this is what our history is. Well, I thought it was quite amazing that West Ham fans were were cheering Ling- or clapping Lingard in the first place. That's not a u- that's not a normal thing to happen. I think uh, maybe it was Roy Keane or someone, one of the other pundits was talking about how that's a strange thing to, you know, and, and uh, Lingard not celebrating when he scored. Yeah. That normally happens against your former club, but he was at West Ham for six months. You know, I guess it kind of shows that it meant a lot. It to meant the, something. It meant, it meant something. Football can be very sentimental, can't it? I mean, if you think about it, it's an environment, like and I'm talking about sort of historically rather than presently, because, of course, football is becoming more inclusive around lines, around gender, of course, quite rightly. And But like, like it, the sentimentality, I believe, is like it's an environment where men, it should traditionally i've been permitted to be emotional like you're like you're i remember when my dad cried when like he was just watching fa cup on telly like when when wimbledon beat liverpool one Mm. nil and you could see that it was just the emotion of oh my god the crazy gang eight years ago they were like playing non-league football they've beat liverpool this is mental that this has happened and you know my dad played football and was a good footballer and so you know it's like it's a framework that's broad enough robust enough to handle it can handle your personal narrative it can handle your stories i 
must say it's yeah it's powerful this is why i think we do this podcast isn't it because it's like you know it's not like we're not going well obviously you're carrying an injury at the moment and i think later <laughs> in the season you'll see you know like because there's people like you know much 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 better qualified to do that but the the sort of the poetics of it the beauty of it that it's it is an intensely personal yet intensely public phenomena the other part about um that match is um for me the kind of constant phenomenon of of highlights and what that i think i i said to you afterwards because you watch the match live mm. as, as you would being a hammer uh, i watched the highlights on match of the day too and i still i know this is obviously people talk about this all the time but i still believed noble was going to score that yeah. penalty like i know you knew i knew and and the moment you see solskjaer throwing that bottle down i don't know if you remember that bit but solskjaer was so angry at <clears throat> the award of the penalty that he hurled this bottle to the to the floor and i i you know i, I was I, I loved seeing that and i thought ah it's brilliant because they're going to equalize and i thought look if they're not going to equalize that doesn't happen this has already happened already yeah I know it's mental, isn't it? I mean, like I sometimes watch highlights things of the Premier League six, six and sixteen, seventeen, and like the one that came up, Everton beat West Ham two 0 when Slaven Bilic was man. And I was like, I was even a bit affected by that. That's <laughs> conditioning, isn't it? That's proper Pavlov stuff. Here's some of my more uh, the ah oh, Russell's breakdown. Did you put that one this in? This is Russell's football breakdown. This is Russell's breakdown. Russell's breakdown. I like your breakdowns. See, that's a jingle made by my mate Cyrus K. You can follow him on Instagram, yeah. maybe under his uh, nom de plume, Sonny Wright, where he does his uh, rock and roll work in. Well, so a, a jingle war between Cy and Lorenzo now, I think. There's a jingle war here live on the show, and that's what we need. We need people that provide us with free jingles. Maybe some, maybe our listeners might start making jingles. Make your own jingles, send them to us. There will be no fee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to be absolutely clear about that. So here's part of my breakdown now, even though I'm not finished asking you to watch our show on youtube review our show across platforms uh, here's some of my observations from west ham's activity in the weeks of course west ham were playing in europe mm -hmm. uh, against dynamo zagreb i liked our kit i want to get that away kit it didn't arrive yet zagreb zagreb it's amazing your pronunciation <laughs> you've always, already called ronaldo ronaldo or something on this show it's weird isn't it because yeah i don't know about words you say these words all the time i know <laughs> i just won't learn words i won't learn them you should have seen when i was in holiday in wales i couldn't get a cab home <laughs> and i'm gonna go to cardigan do you mean can canadigan i don't know just get me back my i got wife i got baby kids i got a dog i in caravan please home home <laughs> like i can't say none of their welsh words um, right, here's my things. The Argentina kits, <laughs> Argentina kits <laughs> that, that West Ham were wearing. Yeah, li I liked it. Lovely, lovely kit. We I liked that there was no ads. Loved it. We were texting about it afterwards, and I immediately went onto Google to see if you could actually buy it, and you can, and you've now bought it. It's coming. It's coming. I think it's it's, it's a, a wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many comments online about West Ham's kit that made me think. Yes, it's a lovely away kit, but I think part of the thing that people like is that there isn't a, a sponsor. No, no it. shirt sponsor, and I suppose that's because the Europa League is a different tournament, and you have to pay individually for a sponsorship of that. And it'd be just like West Ham not to have done a deal for that particular <laughs> aspect of the shirt. But I want to get that shirt. I'm gonna get that shirt. Um, another observation: You think there's a big gap around the London Stadium? Well, Dynamo is a grip. It's a massive gap yep. between the uh, stands and the pitch, and a big blue, big blue moat. A lot of those are old um, Running Euro tracking. European stadiums. Is it because of communism? Like I have no idea about the It'll historical be. reasons for well, it. Well, I do. I'm going to guess it's communism. <laughs> we will have a big running track around it as well for the people. Is this bad that I'm saying that? Probably. Yeah, I'll take that back. But leave it in and we'll see if it was bad. <laughs> oh, because that's never gone wrong before. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, no, take it out. <laughs> um, right, this is an observation for about uh, the game against um, Manchester United from mm. the sort of first half. Bowen needs to kick the ball harder. He does, he's doesn't shooting. he? Kick it harder. Yeah, if he'd have literally just kicked it harder, kick that, it a bit harder. that was going to go in, wasn't it? I love Jared Bowen. I love him. You love him because of Hull. Mm. I love him because of West Ham. Kick it harder. <laughs> A bit harder. So if I was in training with Joe Bowen, oh, Joe, come over here. Love you. Love you. Love your air. Love your look. Love your uh, runs. I love that bit where you sort of run it out for a throw on. I love all that. Mm. You're tenacious. Mm. When you're in front of goal, <laughs> kick it harder. Harder. A bit harder. I don't think he's maybe used to being Kicking so... It being so close to the goal. I mean, at Hull, he was known for, I mean, all sorts of goals. He scored goals from everywhere. But a lot of what he did was score from 
a fair bit of distance. And, uh, I mean, he can hit it hard. Can he kick it oh, hard? Oh, Bowen. Very he, hard. Very hard indeed. So I'm surprised he didn't kick it hard in this instance. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he'd have kicked it hard. I do. I've got some other observations. Ole Ganasolski are yeah. giving, a, he was giving drinks to the players. Too much like a waiter. Yeah. Like... I think preserve your status. Mm. Like have someone else give them Ferguson drinks. won't do that, would he? He wouldn't give them a oh, yeah, drink. Was that too cold? No. You're right. Skiff your brain freeze. I don't think Klopp would do that. Tuchel wouldn't Pick do that. Pick it up off the floor. Yeah. Do it yourself. <laughs> lick it up from a dog's bowl. <laughs> you could lick it from a dog's bowl I, before I feed it to you. Want me to feed it to you, uh, dentist? Ah, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> uh, That's me reacting to the idea that I might feed it to you like your gerbil at the gerbil cage sucking at the metal nipple of the water boob. You went into a Schwarzenegger there. I know, I just cut it lured me in. <laughs> <laughs> I was lured into it. Uh, Ronaldo was too leery, apparently, against young boys when in the technical area. Yes, he's Did had stick that? for that, hasn't he? Or Ollie's had stick for that. Don't for, let him be so leery. For letting... Well, for for him to become a, a kind of manager, in a, in a way. You know, de facto mm. manager. Like, who are those players taking more advice from? Who are they listening to more? You know, the actual manager or the de facto manager. And I think uh, maybe this instant it was instance it was Keane who criticised Oliver so like Ronaldo's come off he's gone he's sitting in the subject. you're the manager take control of this because ultimately they lost the game so you know it's not like it worked what was Ronaldo doing in the technical what exactly was he was he just standing up he was standing up next to Solskjaer yeah Oh, that's a that's a status challenge. Yeah, I mean, look, I guess it's one of those again with, with like with all football, like with Noble taking the penalties. Like if it works, if he comes off and he shouts at the players and it works and they win the game, then fine. If it doesn't, then questions are asked. And I suppose it's if it lines up with the sort of perception because the idea around Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is that he's a nice person mm. and like obviously, you know, I mean, he's a, like obviously an amazing athlete and a successful oh, yeah. person. So it's only, it's only within the terms of elite performers and managers and stuff that these critiques are being offered but if there was a perception that he was like a right bastard or they're going to associate that like pinned people to the wall in the dressing room and like it's like you better sort out like you know when you watch like old 80s 90s manager yeah <laughs> manager half time talks where they're like, you i'll do you mate you better if you perform i'll kick you off i'll do you <laughs> like, my god it's actual that's assault <laughs> yeah that one i sent you recently i don't I know if it was where he said was well, something about dinner where he said, and you can you can have your dinner and bring it with you. And I tell you what, you better bring your you dinner with bring you because you, you're going to need it. You're going to need your dinner, you <laughs> C-word. I'll C-word you up the F, you <laughs> C-word in F-hole. So it's like, my God, this is like, this is like yeah. James Joyce. It's like a sort of a river of language flowing to who knows where. You can't imagine that being the case now with a lot of these managers. I mean, I'm sure a lot more goes on than we're, than we're aware of, than the you know, personas that we're presented with on match of the day and stuff but um, you can't imagine it goes to those levels and I think the thing about Oli Gunnar Solskjaer as well is he exists within the context of previous Man United managers mm. of course he exists within the, the current context of managers Mourinho Van Hull there you Fergie. go Ferguson we, uh, uh, he doesn't fit the archetype does he and I think that underpins so many mm. um, opinions uh, from pundits and, and you know all sorts about Solskjaer is almost his record yes his record certainly in the Champions League is not good at all he's got a very he's a poor record in the Champions League with United but his league record isn't bad you know he's done better than Marino so um, you know finishing second and it, it, he exists within that context of being judged against not only Ferguson's results but those types of managers and, and the way that they behave towards their teams Ole Gunnar Solskjaer isn't that he's he's nice isn't he he seems nice the baby face assassin or whatever he's, he's he didn't like being called that <laughs> <laughs> why are you looking at us Jenny May Finn Ben Foster would like to join in 10 minutes how do you know because I'm texting him. You're texting Ben Foster? Yeah. Did you see him on Match of the Day? No. His team Watford beat Norwich, the team you support. I know, I knew they were playing. Huh? I knew that they were playing each other. Why didn't you pay more attention? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but he would like to join in 10 minutes well, and asked if it's okay. It is okay. okay. Ben Foster's really handsome, Jen. Yeah. Oh, are you going to set me up with him? He's got, oh, he's yeah. got, is he fam- he's got a family. Oh. He's got a chiseled so chin. Then why did you say that? I don't know, because he might oh, not be what? happy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask him Ben how's your marriage wait question. aren't footballers really young why is he married they get married young because of the how old is he from, but he is actually a senior veteran he's oh, 38 yeah. Oh. Yeah. he's 38 he's really into bicycling are we going to do that thing where we don't ask him the same bicycling. question does anyone <laughs> say that yeah, he's really into bicycling very common term around where my way is speaking hey, of keepers 
what do you think about De Gea? We're talking about the West Ham I think game. he looks like homeless you. That's what I think. <laughs> it's, he's got an interesting look at the moment. He's he's never he's pinned t- down a, a look, has he? He looks a bit like Cat Weasel. Google it. And he looks a bit like Albert Steptoe. Google it. And he looks <laughs> a lot like Gareth, right? Gareth's very handsome. Some of you won't know this yet. Now, people have always said that De Gea looks like, like you look like De Gea. Oh, yeah. you look like De Gea. But the thing is now is that you look more healthy <laughs> than De Gea because De, De Gea looks like you, you've been hitting the pipe a little bit <laughs> kipping in a car I'm not suggesting that's what the hair is doing obviously but he's like a bit well alright I'm in gold for me you know I need oh it's, yeah mate you got <laughs> bitcoin it's only for a cup of tea it's, I think it's mainly the, the beard is very scraggly and long at the moment and the hair is <laughs> he's got that sort of weird, weird duck tail thing he's, he's gone for yeah. he's thin as you like hasn't he yeah he is I mean he's always been he's always been thin and I'm angry because that penalty got missed as uh, well, yeah so I think so that that and, and, and the thing about him is that he's not, he's not a good penalty saver you know he's got a really bad record with penalties I think he hadn't saved a penalty in like 40 attempts or something before that so it's even more uh, insulting yes, that he would choose he would this moment to... and then to look like the way that he currently does on the television yeah, well, I'll show you the penalty <laughs> I ain't done it for 40 attempts but today I'm going to pull one out of <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean that in a mean way. I no. know you're a human being and I love you. And I also know you're not listening. Probably. Probably. He might be. Another, yeah, I know we get a lot of goalkeepers. <laughs> Another observation by old Russ in my breakdown. Martin Atkinson, the referee. Yes. He looked like referees of yesteryear. He's tubby. He's, he's tubby. He's old. He's not fit for work. <laughs> no, I'm not attacking him. But like, I, I was surprised, actually. Martin, I was surprised he can do that I running was around like that. Yeah. Like, he's like referees of yesteryear. Absolutely. Like, when a referee's like sort of an old, sort of like a copper or whatever with a comb over <laughs> and that, like, blowing on his whistle. This geezer, well, old. No, it's not like, I like them ones that are like a bold. Yeah. Look like proper scary bastards. I know. You know? There Uriah is. Uriah Rennie and like them sort of really scary, mad skeleton men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you like them. They're good. <laughs> but this one, that's an old 70s refs. Yeah, it was a bit of a throwback, wasn't it? I wasn't. I maybe hadn't seen him for quite a while. And then I, I remember watching it and thinking, huh, you're able to do this with... Maybe he's just one of those people. You know, there are people that can be bigger, I'm being very careful here, but still be very athletic and have lots of stamina, you know, but carry... I mean, my friend Andy, for example, carries a little bit of timber, you could argue, and goes off for 10k runs all the time. So, I don't know. Where's he carrying it? Uh, <laughs> on the tumbo? On the tumbo? It's the tumbo. Or is it the lower back it's the t- fat? It's the top <laughs> <laughs> half. Top half tumbo. Yeah. But, you know, maybe he's like that. Maybe he's like Andy. I was just worried that he was so elderly. But like, I'm the, who who are we to judge and discriminate against this person well, doing their job? No. Jenny, you don't think we're anyone that should be doing that, do you not? No, older people can still run around. Yeah, do what they want. Jen, I see you don't join in so much since we've asked that you crane your neck forward. It's so hard. It's like, hard. <laughs> what it is, that's shown the level of commitment Jen has to football is nice. That, like, once you're like, could you lean in? <laughs> well, I'm not doing that. I'm going to sit back here. No, me. I've been leaning in, but you haven't been talking to me the I last four episodes. I to you. I've spo- only spoken four the first episodes. one. Well, well, you, that's why, because of the stuff you said, Jen. <laughs> right, now, remember, I asked the question. I made a nice video. I mm. found a part of my front room where I look, or kitchen, that was, where I look like um, the, the corpse of Che Guevara. Yeah, I was a little surprised by the, the manner in which you asked this question. Why? I, I thought it was quite a good question. What's wrong with the manner? Uh, it was very um, lackadaisical, I suppose you could say. Laconic? Um, laconic. Lethargic. Lethargic. Lazy. Yeah. Sloppy, uh, slovenly. I, I mean, I... If I'd have seen it and I didn't know you, I'd have thought, is he, is he all right? <laughs> is he dying or something? <laughs> so I didn't, yeah. I mean, I thought, let's, you know, let's not translate that to the actual podcast itself. But nevertheless, it yielded good results. Well, I'll tell you what it is, Gal. Is like when I was talking to you and David Squires yeah. on a, when we were talking us about football and that ourselves mm. on a Zoom call or whatever, I noticed that the lighting was very good there. I know. And that I looked like Che Guevara while in state. Yeah. And I thought... Do like everything that. in this state now. Stay there. <laughs> and like, I know I'm not endorsing Che Guevara's attitudes uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Cuban War and the execution of people for their sexual identity. That's clearly wrong. But how he looked in state. He looks cool. Gorgeous. Yeah. And that's how I looked for a minute there. So I thought I'd just do a video there. But also where I'd gotten into the mindset of a dead Che Guevara, a God yeah. rest his soul, his communist soul, I, uh, I, I, I was a bit like... I guess it didn't give me enough pep in my step. No, it didn't. 
I'm lacking in pep. It's like you were channeling his cadaver or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cadaver channeler. If you're going to channel, channel the live person, because we can all channel the dead one. Just there they are. <laughs> dead. Dead in this realm. All right. Football is nice. Questions of the week. Top responses. Worst reactions. Have you going to read some of these, mate? Uh, I've got a few for you, Go on, if then. you want. Yeah. Um, my darkest moment was in the pub in East Dulwich. Uh, this is from Dan Umfrey. Yeah, uh, I was in a pub in East Dulwich when Zidane scored those two late goals against England in the World Cup. I threw the cont- contents of my beer at some French fans, missed, hit a group of Millwall fans, did not go down well. Uh, I ran up Lordship Lane, which sounds like a euphemism. <laughs> Straight up Lordship Lane, I find my comfort again. TV Terry says, quite simply, I S in the sink. Do you think he means S H I T? He does mean that. Because yeah. S there's not a w- word for wee wee that begins. With I mean, he has said the word. I'm just trying to be careful. You oh, know. I see. That's he, what he does. He sh in the sink. That's too. That's why. That's excessive. I would say. Yeah. Um, and that was the point of the question. Wicklow W says when Liverpool drew three three the Palace in 2014, throwing away the title. Mm. Uh, Putting an end to our title challenge, I remember my dad sitting, I love this, sitting in the living room in the dark after the match, dejectly stating that there was now nothing left to look forward to in life. <laughs> just <laughs> sitting in the dark. That is a, I think that's quite a classic thing to do, isn't sitting it? As, in a, the as dark. a man, just that's the way to kind of process I go out and walk the dog. Oh, yeah. Danny Dyer says, to be fair, Danny Dyer, West Ham fan. Oh, actual Danny Lovely Dyer. Danny Dyer says, to be fair, Russ, it was a, I think you. I think the authenticity of the of whether or not it's the real Danny Dyer who we love, is in the lexicon used by this <laughs> Danny Dyer. Do you tell me whether you think this sounds like Danny Dyer? Because I do think it does. To be fair, Russ, it was a double kick up the bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's real Danny Dyer. Yeah. Because Danny Dyer is a slang poet. Mm. He's a vernacular poet. He speaks very beautifully. He does. in the vernacular of his class. Hasn't he done like? Shakespeare readings, or, or who was it that um, Harold Pinter? Pinter, that was loved right. him. So yeah, he was, Pinter. He, he, he was he was his favourite actor, one of his favourite young actors, or whatever. <sighs> I've, I've got a couple here. Wrong. Breaking up with my then boyfriend because he said it's just a game, and that was replied to by Freddie saying he had a girl who did the same, didn't work out. Derek Farrell says, at the age of 10, I killed a Brazilian trapeze artist <laughs> after he mocked me for believing David Neary's toe poke against Brazil in '82 didn't end in Scottish victory. <laughs> That can't be true. No, uh, isn't true. <laughs> that's not. That's simply not true. Well, there's some good reactions. Have you got more reactions? Uh, William there? Target. We're warming up for Ben Foster. Yeah, we are. Can I just ask before you do, William Target? Mm. I respect William Target. Oh, a don't lot. we all? But like, there's a few things we've got. To listen to some more of Cyrus K, my mate's jingles. And if you, if Lorenzo's providing free jingles, we're, we're listening to them and all. Anyone that's providing free jingles, bring them on. <laughs> but like, um, I want to also say, mate, um. Are we going to interview Ben Foster a la Seaman? We don't want to ask any questions. About, or, is, or does Ben Foster, with no disrespect to him, not have the same amount of cultural um, uh, cargo that Seaman has? Like yeah. you have to avoid the ponytail, the Ronaldinho, the whatever. With Foster, should we just have free reign? I think probably so. Free reign with Foster. Yeah, I think so. I, I don't know what we would eliminate. I mean, mm. we're going to have well, to. Man U. We're going to have to cover that he was at Man U. Gee, I, I looked up before and he only had 12 caps for Manu, which is, you know, you, I still view him as... Are you going to call them caps because Manu in the country? <laughs> apps. Did you say apps? I'm not sure which I said. <laughs> he said Jen, caps. Would, you, would you play that back, Jen? <laughs> <laughs> we need to work out where his caps are. Yeah, so like what you're thinking... It's, well, I, so I was going to ask him about his time at Man U. And I was going <laughs> to. You do that. I'll just get into like he's talk, he's, a, he's a bicyclist. I'll yes, talking about his bicyclism. Yeah, we'd love to know more about that. How he got mm. into that? Why he loves it so much? Like playing like a thirty-eight ain't that even old for a goalkeeper, is it? What about Billy Bonds, outfield player, forty forty-one? I mean, players are just getting older and older. Like, I like him being all nice. Ibrahimovic. And old. How old is he now? Forty. I'd like to see unbelievable Captain Tom style geriatrics tottering around <laughs> the pitch on Zimmer frames. Yeah, what's happening now? People I, are getting I mean, fitter. It's, yeah, people are getting fitter. People are getting it? fitter and younger. Yeah. People are, are Ronaldo. I, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you. I'll tell you something. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Right. I hope he's watching this because we got to send tape of this to Alex Ferguson and we right because I would love it. Oh, I, I don't think Palace should be booked for taking their top off. I What's compl- wrong with it? I completely agree. That's nice. I like it. It's a ridiculous thing to happen. Mo Salah has got a beautiful body. He has. It's a beautiful body, Mo. <laughs> it's it's utterly ludicrous, isn't it? 
Do you, what about when like Bob Mortimer does impressions of Harry Kane, right? Like and goes, "I was the top scoring Christian in the Premier League because <laughs> like Mo Salah's mostly uh, the top set, top scoring Christian." <laughs> that that's the lines along which you would you would add what the religion is because it gets mentioned a lot though, done it in the tabloids. What the Mo Salah's Muslim? Yeah, you right. Know what they're doing? If you are a Muslim and you're called Mohammed, change it to Mo while you're in a Western country. People will relax about Islam. Yeah, so that seems to be the technique. Ben Foster is in the waiting room. Oh. Ben Foster, how do we get him on? Jen, come let him in. I can't see him, Jen. I can't see him. Ben? Oh, there he is. Oh my God, I can see him. Oh, wicked. Do I need to unmute on this, Jenny? Can you hear me, Ben? I can hear you. Are you okay? Well, we we're so happy to see you. you. Look so handsome and lovely. And look, look, can you see him, Gareth? This is Gareth. We do the podcast together. Gareth's a okay. whole fan. I'm a West Ham fan. Thanks for coming on, Ben. How are you, mate? I'm really good. Thanks for having me. Who is Gareth? Who's in support? Sorry. How the, t- the Tigers? Oh, I honestly didn't. I wasn't even taking the mic then. I just didn't hear it. Honestly. Oh, you, okay. Okay. You must with be. You. you must be friends with uh, our former keeper, Bo Myhill. I imagine you're good friends. Very good friends. He is one of my best friends in football, actually. Um, he se- he a seems like player. a lovely he, he man. Very, very, very good goalie for Hully was, wasn't he? Really, really good goalie. All four divisions. Yeah, he did. He did. Lovely bloke, honestly. Lovely bloke. You should see him now. He's about three times the size of the old boy was my hill. We were talking about the propensity for footballers in the declining years to balloon out into massive things. Say, for example, Alan Brazil, who we love and respect. Or like this new phenomena of the footballer fighting on into the autumn and even winter of their life. Now, I wouldn't say as a goalkeeper, you're in that territory yet as a 38-year-old. I watched you on match of the day, mate. Uh, uh, well played. You're looking handsome. You're playing well. How does the game change as you uh, as you become more mature and more experienced, both um, technically but also emotionally and psychologically? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, I think the match, the actual match day between, you know, that 90 minutes between start and finish actually becomes a little bit easier because it's kind of all, I think I think for me anyway, it's, it's most of it's in my head. Um, once the game kicks off at three o'clock, it's, it's sort of autopilot and it's a nice place to be autopilot is because you don't really think too much about what you're doing. It just comes so naturally. It's the, I think it's just the week to week sort of training. Um, you know, you might turn up on a Tuesday sometime in the middle of, sort of winter and it's freezing cold and frosty and your body's already hurting so that's the bit that I struggle with um but like I say the the match on Saturday was my first Premier League match in just over a year and as soon as the whistle went the the adrenaline sort of kicks off and uh, two or three levels and you just know what to do it's a lovely feeling lovely place to be yeah, you're describing, I suppose, the flow states that performers and athletes talk about a lot, where you need to be real present, but you can't have a second voice in your mind messing with you. We spoke to David Seaman about like the sort of the sort of the necessary concentration for a top flight goalkeeper and how that might intersect with sort of certain psychological issues. Have you ever felt that, Ben, that you're on like sort of the precipice of such a sharp line of focus that sometimes your own mind messes? with you it's uh, honestly i think the goalkeeping for me is is it's all in your head the majority of it is in your head i think most goalies are of a certain level and most can make big saves and big things it's it's the bit in between your ears the decision making the being calm under pressure like you say being on autopilot we when I, i'm at watford now but when i when i first signed at watford i think it was about 15 odd years ago um, I was still only like 22, 23, and I was very young, very naive, a very different person. I just didn't know. I didn't understand that side of the game. I didn't understand the mental side of it. And we, fortunately enough, had a psychologist um, based at the training ground. Uh, Keith Mincher, his name was. And he was incredible, honestly. He, got, he made you understand of when you're aware of what you're doing and when you're not aware of what you're doing. And he, he always used to say, if you know you know, you are killing it. So, so basically autopilot. If you can get onto that autopilot, that's when you can kill it. Because there's days when you go out on the training pitch, because there's no pressure on the training pitch. You just go out there and perform. You have a good laugh with your, with your mates. You just do it naturally. Normally, it's autopilot. And if you can transfer that out onto the pitch as well and do it autopilot on the pitch, you have nailed it, honestly. 
Yeah, I heard that described as the phases of learning are unconscious incompetence. You don't know your crap. Conscious incompetence. You know your crap. Conscious competence. You're getting good and you're aware of it. And unconscious competence, where you sort of you're at a level now where the focus is sublime. Ben, you're a very um, good communicator. And Gareth here says that you are the natural heir to Lineker and will soon become the uh, one day become the face of uh, the Premier League or British sport or, Brin- or English commentary or however you want to term Gary Lineker. He, like you. Obviously, you do your your YouTube channels at a big success. Um, how did you get into the broadcast side of what you're doing, and what's your um, uh, your what do I want to say? Your vision for it going forward? Yeah, I think I think for me, um, I don't know about you guys, but the I don't really like the structure of the big organisations, BBC and um, Sky Sports. People are like that. Don't get me wrong; there is a place for it. There's time for it, but I just do. I love the freedom, and I love being able to have my own voice to say what I want to say, when I want to say it, and do it when I want to do it. And that's with YouTube, all the other bits and bobs that I do. I can choose when I want to do that. I've got my own platform now, and I think that for me is something that probably interests me more than what you mentioned there a minute ago. Don't get me wrong; it'd be fantastic, but. I, I don't know, it's a little bit too stuffy for me, to be honest with you. I don't think they would take kindly to me, sort of. I, I don't go effing and jeffing anyway, but I don't, you know what I mean? I'm not so quite so, sort of, I don't say it quite as well as what Gary Lineker would, I suppose. Just, that's how I could put it. Well, it's quite restrictive. These medium, like these media require a lot of, there's a lot of protocols and there's a lot of time requirements. There's a lot of regulatory requirements. And yeah, you can see that like in some ways it's loosening up. But like, is it, do you, do you even mean in a sort of slightly sensorial way that there's some things? Because I was thinking then, right, <laughs> that we'd have to be careful with you in a way that we wouldn't have to be another guest because you're still playing, you're still employed. And like sometimes, you know, you're, perhaps, you know, I could be a, like a little bit frivolous about things and interested in like with you like say with your your manager um your manager hold on i can do this <laughs> wait for us no please give me a second uh francisco javier munez lumpier right like uh you you for example won't be able to openly speculate as to whether or not he looks like a former 90s boy band member specifically anthony costa <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I can jump feel? on that. Yeah, I'm with you. I see. I see what you're saying. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, I see what you're saying too. But Anthony Costa's a little bit sort of like pussier, isn't he? But I see what you're saying. <laughs> And like, and also, what I feel. What do you feel like with when managers come in and you've got to transfer all of your respect and allegiance over to them? And what kind of physical, personal contact you're having, and how much does it vary? Because you know, like in the mind of a fan, a, a, a manager, right? Put put in a quite a reductive way, is if you know, like you could say it in a clever way, is a patriarchal authority figure, or you could say a dad. One of my mates, it was David Badil, actually said that whenever I used to do my Guardian column about football, I was always obsessively writing about the managers, and he says that he felt that I was working through for like father issues like you know like when Mourinho was a thing I was really trying to understand Mourinho and even though he's at Chelsea and I'm a West Ham fan I liked Mourinho I liked something about him sort of charismatic and fun and all these sort of things that he is at his best Um, and what what kind of psychological relationship do you find yourself having with managers and how do you deal with the sort of necessary abandonment and transitions that occur in that role particularly bloody at Watford this is brilliant okay so um, (laughs) I've I've had a lot of managers and you do I, I, I'd like to think that I'm fair. I'm a fairly good judge of character. I get to see, I understand how kind of people work a little bit, I suppose. And I've seen some absolute monsters, some whoppers, some massive sort of egotistical demons that just love like the power and they need and crave the power. And they're so narcissistic as well. Um, and then again, I've played for other ones who you can see are actually a little bit sort of timid and a little bit don't know whether they should be saying that or doing that kind of thing. Um, I can only the, the guy that we've got in charge at the minute, um, Zisco. He's he's just he's basically he's a bit like me, really. He, he doesn't care, honestly. He's wicked. I love it. He's he'll say what he wants to say and do what he wants to do. He loves to have a laugh. He's still kind of I think he only turned forty or something the other the other few weeks ago. So he loves going out for a beer. He loves having a laugh. Um, and I think for him, it's really important to get the senior players on board so he can talk to us. I think that's why. He, you might have heard a lot of people say about having like a, a British core or a strong English core or something like that. And that's basically just so we kind of know the lay of the land a little bit better than some of the some of the foreign players. So we can tell them and instruct on them and show them what the fans see and what they want and what they expect from you. Um, but it, it's good. You should do a whole show just on managers and about like some of them. Wow. I, I, I can't go into names because I'm, I'm still playing and I'll just expose myself. But yeah, there's some 
proper horrors out there. But what about then when you have an encounter with a, like a recognised genius or great like Ferguson? Can, is it something, is it impossible to be objective about a figure like that because they come with so much sort of cultural mystique uh, or, or can you actually sort of get the sense in a, in a personal way of, oh, wow, that's greatness. I'm experiencing greatness. Um, not, no, I don't see it like that. I see it more of if, if I really like and really respect that person, that manager, I will do anything for them. I'll, I'll do it anyway, but you, you, you enjoy doing it. Do you know what I mean? You want to please them. It's like a dog and a master or something. You want to please that manager. And I think that for me is, especially in modern football, it's the, the only real way you can be. I think, like you say, you, you mentioned uh, Mourinho there. I think, I think to an extent he's been found out because when he first came over, he was this kind of, you like say, about mystical guy, the special one, all that kind of stuff. And people genuinely just were like astounded by this new sort of wave of manager that's come over. But I think the way that he's gotten a bit older, it's almost like he's got a little bit grumpy and he doesn't stand for this and he, he's not having players doing this and that. And players don't like it anymore. You know what I mean? When you've got players on 120 grand a week and they're being told they're not allowed to drive these fancy cars and wear earrings and stuff, they just go, all right, sod off. I've got four years left on my deal. I'll just sit it out. And But then that breeds through the rest of the team and it just doesn't work like that anymore. You've got to have, I think you need a younger manager who's got really good people skills. That for me is somebody I want to play for. Because mm. well, you know, right? See, in my little world, I done a film. It's not out yet. It was directed by Kenneth Branagh, right? And like, so I know Kenneth Branagh's fantastic from all the things he's done and from what he's achieved. And then, like, when I'm actually with Kenneth Branagh, I'm looking for right. What is it? What is it? You know, and it, like he was both directing the film and acting in it. And you can see as an actor how easy it comes to him, at least after all of the work that he would have put into it. And there's this bit where he's directing me, right? And like, it was an emotional scene or whatever. And like he was going, right, you need to be still, Russell. And I goes, oh, all right, I think I am being. He goes, no, you're not. You're moving your head, right? And he's like, Kenneth Branagh, like he drilled down so hard into like, do like he was directed, like in the end when I was doing it, I was nearly crying, which was what was required of me actually in the scene because of Kenneth Branagh did a thing that no one else had been, has done to me as a director. I thought it was some like good directors also, but like I sort of saw him do it. It was, it was sort of amazing. I felt myself, I started to sort of tremble and it wasn't, it was because of like, he was sort of like drilling me into a pinnacle. He was controlling me, directing me. And because, I mean, I wouldn't accept it under normal terms, you know, if we was out about on the street i say wind your neck in ken i am who i am but given that he was directing the film i yielded I think, this is where, I think for a goalkeeper it's i think goalkeepers are, they're slightly different to outfield players because we don't like we don't really have that relationship with managers so much where they need to because the most most managers are outfield players aren't they so mm. because a goalkeeper mm. is a specialized position we have that we have that sort of relationship with our goalkeeper coach. That is to me, that is my manager at times. My goalie coach is my manager. And I've I've been in the same situation where I've worked with a goalie coach. So I've one, one goalie coach I've worked with who does this is called Neil Cutler. He's Aston Villa goalie coach now. And he is exactly the same. He's played the game to a decent level, but he's now become a genuine sort of like master on the art of goalkeeping. Because I think that goalkeeping in particular can be drilled down to the minutest detail. So like when you watch Match of the Day on a Saturday night, for example, I could, and he could, look at a goal and then you can look at the goalkeeper and you could scrutinise every single movement, whether it's his hands, his feet, his head, his eyes, his body shape, how tall he is, is he stood up enough, is he too low? All that kind of stuff can be genuinely scrutinised to the tiniest, minutest detail. And that is, again, like you say, it's scary, but I think as long as you can be open to it and you can go, yes, this happened. He, like He can even tell me, you weren't confident enough on that cross. You didn't. And I will go, yes, you are correct. And it hurts inside to say it, but you know it because it's the way it is. And as long as you're open enough to sort of accept it, then I think that's the only way you can grow properly. So that for me is that guy. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah, that's good. I know Gareth's got questions because I can see from looking at his face. I'll tell oh. you, so you, can, <clears throat> so you can see, so you can see Ben nicely. Nice to meet you, Ben. I had a nice cu couple of questions about, um, I guess, what what you're doing with your YouTube channel and your podcast. Um, obviously, it's, it's quite rare that a, a, that a player will start doing this kind of thing during their playing career. And, you know, a lot of punditry these days, it's retired retired players who then go into punditry. So I had a couple of questions. One kind of follow-up to what you were saying about BBC and Sky 
I, I noticed, and I'm sure a lot of people noticed, that these positions tend to get filled up these days with players who've played for, you would call, the top four clubs. And I wonder if that's a feeling around players now going into doing punditry, is whether these kind of big positions are almost kind of sewn up by what, who you've played for in, in your career or maybe even what trophies you've won. Um, and the second one was just whether or not um, you've had any kind of pushback for starting to do the broadcasting that you're doing, and you are a very natural broadcaster, uh, in terms of the fact that you're still playing and, and whether or not that's been an issue with anyone. I don't know what Watford are like at all, but you get a lot of access to current Watford players and, and previous players. So I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, OK. So, yeah, first question. Um, yeah, I think the big gigs, I think, so, you know, your, your, Sunday, um, your Sunday afternoon football, your Monday night football, I think they're, they're kind of boxed off. You have to be a big boy. You have to play to a really big level and be a big name in the game, which I suppose is a shame. But again, it, I think it's maybe just a bit of a symptom of kind of the world we live in nowadays, where regardless of what you do, if you're a big name, you've got a chance of, of being in the mix for that kind of thing. Don't get me wrong, you still see a lot of um, kind of reti- retired players doing the, the Wednesday, Wednesday night sort of championship and a few the odd pr- Premier League game here and there sort of thing. But in the main, it is, it's boxed off, which it's a little bit of a shame, to be honest with you, but it's, you know, I, I can understand it, but I know for a fact there are guys out there who've retired who are fantastic in front of a camera, and if you want them to analyse a game, we'll be able to analyse it and go into details and tactics a lot better than some of them people on the telly will, but it's, again, it's a bit more of if the face fits, and uh, I don't know what it is, whether there's a workaround of that or what, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, on to the second question. For sure, I've had some pushback. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, there's, it's, it's, it's a. I have to sort of tread a very fine line at times because, say, say if I, all right, just say I played my first game on Saturday against Norwich and we got pumped six 0 and then I'm going and putting a, like I put a video out last night, a vlog out last night of it. Oh, it's, it's a good news story. We have won. I've done a lot of like. There's a. It's a very. I always do it in a chronological order, so it starts the day before a game. Um, so. To the point of when the game comes, I've already got sort of 15 minutes of footage. Um, so when the game happens, if we get pumped 6-0 and I'm still on the camera going, never mind, it's not the end of the world, which is the way I kind of look at it sometimes. I've been, you know, I've been beat 8-0 away at Man City and 5-0 down after 18 minutes. And afterwards, I've come out and said, they were amazing. They were, they were incredible. And you get so much abuse from it. And you think, well, why though? I'm not, like, I didn't try to let any goals and I didn't try uh-huh. to do anything bad. They're just really good at football. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they, they people just don't understand that though. They think that when you lose a game, you should be straight on the coach, sort of gutted, absolutely heartbroken, and then almost straight back into the training pitch, working on things to sort of correct it. And that's mm. not the world I live in, you know. Like I said, I've been, I've been in football twenty odd years now. It is what it is. That's the best way to deal with it to me as well. That's the best best way I've learned to deal with it. Anyway, is no matter what's happened on a Saturday, good, bad, or indifferent, you just got to stay on the same sort of steady line. Um, so yeah, I have had, I've had quite a bit to be fair, but I think you just got to wear it. You've got to own it and it is what it is and I'll never ever change. So they, I think everybody's just given up to hating or having an opinion about it really now and just looks forward to it a bit more. Shows that there's this weird ceremonial component to football where fans expect you to be a kind of avatar because for the fan, it is a cathartic experience. Like talking about the most recent West Ham game, right? Like, you know, I'm not a season ticket holder anymore. I'm watching on telly. I'm going once or twice a season, you know, if that, right? And like, but when I was watching that game, that United game and like the Jesse Lingard came on and scored in the 88th minute and then Mark Noble missed that that penalty or De Gea saved it probably from your perspective (laughs) (laughs) like like I'm going through a sort of a a set of emotions that it would be sort of in a sense ridiculous to expect like uh, 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 Suchek even to like his experience is going to be different because he's an athlete he's involved he's got a set of very particular jobs goals and objectives and I'm going through you know the feelings I still carry about the London Stadium the first time I went to West Ham my feelings about Mark Noble my feelings about masculinity my feelings about sport all these things are packaged up in that for a fact and like and like you know and i think the whole ceremony the whole ceremonial and collective experience carries so much that they do think no we have projected all that emotion on you 
and like so you know if you lose then you are expected to sort of like that should because there's an unconscious religious acts aspect to football and if you lose it's sacrificial and if you win it's celebratory and triumphant and if your behavior don't match that because for you it isn't that because you're not a fan you're an athlete doing a job who's got a very particular mindset who's not living in that you know that's why i think those players like your um whether it's like gerard or jt or like players that sort of became or gaza being perhaps the the most complete example where it seems like this person has just wandered out of the terraces and is like a realization of that spirit that's why they have this unique rapport you know because they seem to be living the fans desire as well as the technical specific esoteric and difficult for us to understand as non-professionals elements of the game what do you think about that ben foster what do you think about you don't that, get that ben? on sky what do you think about that, ben? i can listen to you all day so you're the man you know freaking out you. mate that was incredible i had to break i had to keep just breaking that down in little segments and then thinking okay just try and remember that first that's ben, how we all deal that. with it ben that's how we all deal with it I think, I think what you're trying to say is basically as soon as emotion is bought into it, so the fans have an emotional connection to the football club, don't they? Mm -hmm. They they live their life around that Saturday afternoon kickoff, the anticipation, and then when it goes wrong, it's the end of the world. And if there's a certain player that doesn't seem to care as much as them, that is when it's a problem. And they just lose their shit and it's just kind of, they'll just go for it kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that's the problem. But And when you get players like you say, like me or like somebody else that, it's not that we don't care. It's just that we're better at dealing with it and just going, well, it is what it is. I tried my best. I worked hard in training all week and on the pitch on a Saturday afternoon, I just couldn't quite do what they could do. And it's not, that's the way it goes. They don't see it like that. Cause like I say, they've spent a lot of money. They've got the kit, they're following, they're supporting. And you can understand it to a point. I just think, um, it's very hard to explain. I don't think it'll ever change. It's tribalism, is it? It's the way that it goes. Mm. I had one question relating to the West Ham game, actually. Um, because there's been a lot of talk about the psychology behind uh, Noble coming Ooh, on yeah. and taking that penalty. And I just wanted, from a goalkeeper's perspective, you're, if you're David De Gea, who you know we've already talked about today, didn't have and a Gareth brilliant... looks like him. Let's just, <laughs> let's just clock that now. A <laughs> little bit. Uh, <laughs> if you're David De Gea, are you happier that Noble's coming on specifically to take that penalty? Or, 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 or is that playing against you psychologically? You are, I would be buzzing that he's coming on just to take that penalty. The first kick of his game is, I, it's an outrageous decision. It is, honestly. There's no, I know David Moyes will come out and say that he's a proven pro, like goal scorer of penalties and it is what it is. But when it's your first kick of the game, it goes beyond the, the actual act of kicking a ball. It's in your head. It's all in your head. And it was a meek penalty, wasn't it? It was yeah. really, really meek. It's, you know, Noble, he, he scored penalties past me for. He nails it in the corner. He drills it in the corner because he knows where he is. He knows what he's doing. He's played minutes in the game already. He's found his feet. That's what he does. But when he came on and took that penalty, I don't know about his warm, his sort of walk up to it and all that kind of stuff. But as soon as he kicked it, it was so... It was like it was a wet penalty and it was an easy save at the end of the day. And he shouldn't have been put in that position anyway. You should just give it to Declan Rice. He would have nailed it. He would have drilled it. As simple as that. Even if you miss the target and you drill it, I'd rather that than taking a meek penalty. Yeah, because it's almost like Declan Rice was in the flow of the game and the rhythm and he understood what was sort of happening as if there's a secondary energy that he can channel. But like like everyone says, like Roy Keane said, if he scored it, well then what a genius David Moyes is. But he didn't. But he didn't. He didn't. No. So there it is. And there's Ben Foster saying that he'd be like, oh, good. Yeah, ben, ben Foster on. who saved penalties in the League Cup final. Uh, which brings me to a question about, and I'm sure this is a bit of a retro question and one you've probably had millions of times, but when you're talking about psychology, how much of that stuff about using the iPod was like blown up and just kind of press stuff and how much of it was important uh, at the time? Is, was that a, a big part of, of the way you were preparing for penalty shoots, shootouts and penalties in general or not? It was, you know what, it was completely blown out, to be honest. It's, 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 that's the way it's done anyway, and it's always been done like that. So when, even before it, like a normal game kind of thing, forget the fact that a game could go to penalties, just in a Premier League game, before the game starts, the goalie coach will come over to the goalie and he will have basically a list on paper of two or three possible players that are playing in that game that will take the penalties. And then you'll see each player and you'll see his last sort of five or ten penalties. For example, three to the left, five to the right, you missed two here. I'd say best bet is go to your right for him and then you do it for the same other two players. Um, but 
the fact that it was technology and it was the first time anybody's ever been sitting on a pitch with a piece of technology showing you that was what they loved kind of thing because it was like that was what about like 15 odd years ago that was um it was when technology was like oh my god they're using technology now but it's the same thing it would have been a piece of paper otherwise right yeah that's just fetishizing the means of the communication all right ben well like it's lovely that you've done this with us got the um cycle go, the bicycle we haven't talked about cycling well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've been cycling. I put one of them trailers on back of my bike and I've dragged my kids around on it. That's what I've done. I mean, but I get the idea I that you're... You so I can definitely see you doing that, Russell. I'm not sure I like, care for your tone. <laughs> 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 well, I've done that. I've stuck them in a little trailer. I've just dragged them around, bumping them around over fields. They seem to enjoy it. Um, like, I don't talk to them. Like, um, so, like, why do you want to get into the cycling? Well, again, it's like something you're very passionate about. And... Um, like when I always think with all these things, when players do like extracurricular stuff and other sports and things, do you have to get like prop uh, different insurance and do the club like tell you what you're able to do and what you're not allowed to do? Like how much control or advice or however you want to term it from a club do you get when it comes to other physical stuff like that, such as like cycling? You could fall off, break your leg, and not be available to uh, to, to to play for Watford. Yeah, it's um it's again it's a little bit like the YouTube really, whereas because I'm sort of like a basically like a dinosaur, I'm so old in the game now, I've been <laughs> doing it for twenty years, they just they just sort of leave you to your own devices. They know um they know and trust that I, I know my body best that whatever I need to do in the week, I'll do it and then I'll be there on a Saturday afternoon with bows and whistles on, good to go. Do you know what I mean? So they genuinely it's not like they turn a blind eye because I do tell them and they, they don't mind. Um but I, I, they just lead me to it now. They've got to that point, like say, even with the YouTube, that there was a resistance at first, but they know that most of it, well, all of it, is a good news story. I'll never show anything that's untoward or going to mm. bring anything into disrepute and people aren't going to be happy with. I'll always show the good stuff. There's no swear and all that kind of stuff. So they just kind of let me get on with it. It's very different for the younger players. Don't get me wrong. They, they can't move a muscle without being <laughs> told what to eat and what to put in the mouth and what exercise to do. Um, but yeah, when you get to my age 38, they genuinely just lead me to do it now. I noticed that what to eat and what to put in your mouth were two separate categories ben and i won't <laughs> i won't i won't go into that in too much detail ben's a youtube channel the cycling goalkeeper and podcast of the same name are of course available Fos 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 they are available Fos and if you want me to come on either of them things and indeed or both of us we will do it so you've got uh, you've got our details now and if you want to come here in person on a bicycle that like you seem to indicate that you were up for then that's also possible ben there are literally no limits but that seems to be the way you're living anyway Thank you. No, honestly, mate, I really do appreciate it. I would love to get you on the podcast. I would absolutely love to. But I love, again, though, when we were texting to sort this out, um, I, I remember saying to you, please let me come to your studio and do it. Because I just wanted to meet you, mate. So we absolutely buzz off you. Like, everybody buzzes off us around. Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Come on. It's one of my favourite films <laughs> ever, ever, ever. And now I don't care what people say. I love comedies and I love easy watches. So it would have been wicked to meet you. But we'll get there one day. Um, it was an absolute pleasure, guys. Thank you. That was lovely and easy. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, oh, cheers, ben. ben. Thanks for coming on. You're lovely. We'll give this to you. You can stick it on your channel and all if you want to. And perhaps you can do a sort of a watch along critique of it. Um, don't hurt my feelings. I'm very. I'm a vulnerable man. Thanks, Ben. That's lovely. I look forward to meeting you. I'll give you a little text or something. Yeah. See you, mate. Pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. Cheers, Ben. Bye bye. Bye bye. See ya. See ya. There he goes, Ben Foster. Brilliant guy, isn't he? He's really good. He's warm. He's lovely. He's fun. He's, he's Ben Foster. He's the natural heir, although he doesn't want to be. He don't want he doesn't to be want much the he's day. He's moving forward. He's, he's got bigger dreams. He's got a bigger vision. Yeah, new media. That's the future, gal. That's mm. where that's where we've been very smart. Now, let's further demonstrate our smartness. Last week, we did predictions, results predictions, and I think it's a good thing for us to do. But let's just see how we got on. Mm. You know, And this is borderline gambling, and gambling is something I'm against. Not just because of what Keith Gillespie, Merce, um, it was that lad that played for us, Matty Everington. Mm. Like gambling, listen, face it, it ain't good. <laughs> it ain't good. No. It's about, it is fun. But when the fun stops, by Jove. Right, so listen, these are our predictions, right, mate? Go on. Right, so Newcastle. Oh, where's the actual results? Is this <laughs> the, on results? the other side. Flick it over. On the other side of the same Flick thing? Flick it over. <laughs> so these are oh, are these predictions and this I, is result. I mean oh, I could is... tell you the results if you want me well, to well you've memorised it okay I mean, I've got them in front of me you do results yep. and I, right so <laughs> we'll they're, in a different, they're in a different order okay. you, you just do yours right 
You just do. All right. So I predicted. Right. Newcastle Leeds. Yep. The result was one. One one. And I predicted two one, and you predicted three one Leeds. We were both wrong. Both wrong. Right. So Wolves v Brentford. I predicted one one. You predicted one nil Wolves. Brentford one two nil. Both wrong. Both wrong. Burnley Arsenal. I predicted one nil Arsenal. Oh no, I predicted two nil Burnley, and you predicted one nil. Yes. And what was it? One nil Arsenal. You ah. Oh, <laughs> That makes me... I'm more angry than one you. 1-0 to the Arsenal. <laughs> Wait, it's not 1988. Um, <laughs> it is at the moment. It is now. <laughs> Two in a row. Right, Liverpool v Palace. I predicted 3-1. Three three one. One. You predicted 2-0. Two 2-0. Two nil. Nil. So we were both right in a way. Right, because I got the 3 and you got the nil. Yeah. Cool. It was 3-0. City v Southampton. I predict City 3, Southampton nil. We both do that. Mm. What was it in nil, real nil. life? 0-0. Nil, nil. Both wrong. Norwich v Watford, in which a certain Ben Foster played beautifully in goal. I think I predicted 2-0 away win. And you predicted 2-1? I'm not sure what I predicted, but I know that... It's been crossed out. It was 1-1 and 2-1 and then... So I suspect... I think you said the same thing. No, I think you... Gareth, can I choose the same as you? And you said, of course. Yeah, it was 3-1 Watford, so I think we were both wrong anyway. But at least we got the result. I mean, it's... So far, the only thing... Yeah, you're right. We got... we, We kind of got it right. Yeah, okay. We're doing okay. We're doing Villa, right. Everton. I predict Villa 2-1. You predicted 2-0. And it was 3-0 three three Villa. Villa. Yeah, really. So I'm getting some results right, if yeah. not scores. Yeah. But the next day. All right. Oh, because this is where you get a little bit of, you get a little squeeze out of this, dear gal. You get a little bit of pleasure. Well, should we go straight to West Ham Man U? <laughs> <laughs> I predicted that West Ham United, the team I've supported my whole life, would win 3-2. You predicted that Man United would win 2-1. Yep. And because of that last minute matter, that you were correct and you correctly predicted that. That's like, that's a stab to the heart and you're to blame. You just spoiled football game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, John Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you were right about that. Oh, Next. and hold on a minute. Spurs. Chelsea Spurs. We well, both predicted 3 new away wins. Another one, right? Hey, we're good at this. Especially you. I've got three on the nose. And a now couple almost want? on the nose. Oh, so you're a saying... A couple of other things that I got on the nose Go this on, Ning. Ooh. We should start a new item. On the nose. Gareth on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> Gareth was arrogant <laughs> displays of predictive powers. Go on, what else did you get on the nose? Right, Ivan Tony, Brentford. Had a great game. Brentford won. He yeah. scored. What did you say about him? What did I, you get well, on the I, nose about I, that? Last week I said to you, I tell you what, talk about Lukaku. Ivan Tony reminds me of Lukaku in his in his manner of play. They only one and brought it up. Martin Keown mentioned it on Match of the Day. What do you mean? You're, so you're ahead of Keown? Ahead of Keown. He said, he's we were talking about Lukaku. You don't think Ivan Tony. Keown's listening to this, nicking our bits. I hope he is. If, right, I like him. Let's listen for Martin Keown, either on Match of the Day or Talk Sport. <laughs> <laughs> if he starts talking about archetypes <laughs> 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 and subtle hidden mysteries and religious rituals, or yeah. then and hang on. Listening. But perhaps what wisely Keown's doing is only listening to the things you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't ask him again. Right, hold on, the other geezer. Yeah, all right. I'm doing that in my punditry. So, but and I, 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 I stick with it. I think he's a. He looks really good. He's re- Brentford look ready made for the Premier League anyway. Ivan Tony looks like he's played in the Premier League for years. He's so cool and calm, and he's so strong. Where's he it, from? Uh, I, I don't know where he's from. He was he was at Newcastle, wasn't he? Then he went to I think Peterborough, and then and then uh, Brentford bought him from Peterborough, and he is just uh, he's taken the. Premier League by storm. He's going to be a big player this year. And don't you? I don't know if you remember. Well, you've got like you've got like ben- a predictions. <laughs> like you've got prediction arrogance. Well, Lineker um, brought up a text he'd got from Peter Beardsley, which was a bit weird when he what did, did that. Do you remember? He it. said he was talking to uh, Keon and G- Genus Genus. And said, I had, and he just out of nowhere just said, I had a text earlier from Peter Beardsley. And they both looked quite shocked about it. They were like, All right, okay. Do you want to tell us before we do this in the rehearsal? And he went, Yeah. He said, um, He worked at Ivan Tony, presumably at Newcastle, and he's a great lad and he's going to be really good. Is uh, <laughs> uh. that like Bob Mortimer's impression of him and all? It was a strange little moment on Match of the Day. Well, I think what it is is people are perhaps realising in mainstream broadcasts that there is a requirement for a little more subtlety and warmth and that people like it. What about when Gary Lineker like, wore his pants because Leicester won the league? Yeah. That was the beginning of it. It's like realising that, you know, because remember, media in this country was, well, it's Match of the Day now. Let's see the results for those hammers. They played West Bromwich Albion. Like, there was a dog on the field. We had it killed. You know, like it was much more stern 
nowadays, oh, I've had a text off Beardsley. Yeah, look at that. I've got a tattoo on me nuts. People w- are more relaxed. I wondered if it was anything, because obviously they know each other very well. They had a great partnership for England. And obviously, w- without going too much into it, there was a lot of the, the stuff with Beardsley that happened in the last few years. Yeah. What, do you think he's rehabilitating Beardsley? I felt Beardsley like, can't have a bad bone in his body, not Beardsley. I felt like it Unless might... Unless you're talking about the shape of those bones. <laughs> no, he's, not, no, no, he's not, not a bad bone in his body, Beardsley. I thought it might have been a little bit of an attempt of that, of kind of, of solidarity with Beardsley, maybe. It's about um, time Gary Lineker paid back the number of goals that he nicked off him during England. Like his, oh, right. He's done all the work, set up the goals, 86, for example. In that documentary, Fever Pitch, yeah. wasn't it funny looking at Beards? Beardsley does not... You don't get Beardsleys in the game anymore. Because well, like, they're unusual looking, dude. Just an un, unusual looking h- whole entity as a footballer. The fact that he was brilliant as well. Yeah, like he was a ferret that had been let loose. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to try playing this ferret, lads. Yeah, like sort of everyone looks a bit like Ben Foster, don't they? Handsome. Yep. So ben Foster looks like a bit like Superman. It's incredible, yeah. It's incredible how good looking Allison, and cool... Ben like Superman. Almost every footballer is now. It's all look a bit like Superman. For How right, that transition Superman. happened? Because you can't. Because obviously styles change, and you know men's grooming and all that has kind of changed massively over the last 10, 20 years. Anyway, but surely, the, like inherently, how people look. How, yeah. how what about built? David James in that documentary? Like mm. he looked. He was so good looking, it was disgusting. I know. Like the same as he mentioned. When he was a model. He still is. He's doing that modelling. He's still modelling now, is he? No, I mean, he's still good looking now. Right. I don't know if he's modelling or not. But the second piece of I told you so. Go on, then you do your on the note. Do you remember (laughs) when I... (laughs) Second piece of I told you so. (laughs) Jimenez, do you remember I said he wears that headgear? And I said it must be so annoying for him. Getting on his nerves because the header is so intricate. Yeah, and it's like an extra bit of skull that he's got on his head. Yeah, it's an exoskeleton. He got so annoyed by missing a header, he threw it off. And it was on the it was on the pitch, and the commentator went, "Oh, he's throwing his headgear off, like kind of in frustration and disgust." Did he just leave it there? He just left it there, like a balloon, like a burst balloon. <laughs> well, Gareth, hold on. My concern is is that you are weaving new realities by happening. the stuff you're saying. You're like a dream weaver, mm. dream weaving new realities. Now that's my concern that you're not predicting the rea- future. You're creating the future. You're what are you going to create now? I, I don't know. Create well, something I, nice. It's a lot of it's a hell of a responsibility. Who have West Ham got next? <laughs> well, I tell Create you what. Create some nice future. Who have you got next? Let's let's look at the fixtures. Leeds You've away. You've got Leeds away. I'd like to win that. That should be we? a good a good game. <laughs> we win against Leeds. That should be a good game. Look, no, I don't want that's not a prediction. Should be a good game. Good game. I think it'll be a good game. <laughs> no, stop it. Leeds is always a good game because I, I, the intensity. West Ham fans are intense. Leeds fans are intense. Well, I saw something the other day that said Leeds let everyone else play their best game too. Like the, the, it's lovely. Yeah, the, the They're like socialists. A, fu- <laughs> a function. Hey, we just right there. We just want everyone to have a bloody good time. Like, no, hold on a minute. Yorkshire. We just want everybody to have a good time. You're from Yorkshire. Oh, sorry yeah. for this. That was offensive. <laughs> uh, the big game this weekend, if we're doing, uh, you know, fixtures, is Chelsea Man City. No, that's, that's actually happening huge. now. It's just it's all the big guns right now, the big boys. It'll be, what do you think? Who do you, all right, hold on. Before we get into yeah. those predictions for Saturday's 12.30 kickoff, Chelsea oh. City, I'll do my breakdown. Break We've still got to listen to all of those jingle jangles. Why are you putting it, Jenny? S- sting for the breakdown, surely. Oh, go on then. Brussels football breakdown. This is Brussels breakdown. Brussels breakdown. <laughs> I like your breakdowns. Oh, yeah. All right. right. So, okay. All right. Carl Pilkington and Patrick Vieira look like each other. <laughs> Palace keeper look like a villain's henchman. He does. Mo Salah has got a nice body and shouldn't be booked for taking his top off. No one should be booked for taking the top off. What's the problem? What's the problem with it? I'll look, I'll look into that for next week. I how, like it. how it came about and why it's still enforced. Keown <laughs> keeps saying, don't ever show your opponent your number, your number. instead of a t- turn your back on the player. Yeah. It's pretty good how he said that. Did you say it a few weeks ago and he's nicked it off you? Almost certainly. <laughs> the other thing about Keon is he seems to refuse to say San Maximan the way that you should pronounce San Maximan. And he said Saint Maximan because he pronounces it like <laughs> so he means saint. it. So, so, saint. so I'm saying Saint. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying Sam. I won't say it. Oh, sh- sh- Jimmy Greaves is dead. Oh, no. I love Jimmy Greaves. Everybody's yeah. granddad, Jimmy Everybody Greaves. Loves Jimmy Greaves. Rest in peace, Jimmy Greaves. What we did observe is that Jimmy Greaves moved straight from being sort of chirpy barra boy goal poacher mm. into a granddad yep. with no chrysalis phase of middle age. Yeah. 
How did that happen? He embraced it. We don't know how it happened. We haven't looked at all the evidence. We need to see a day by day. You know, like on the internet, you see a picture a day of a baby or something. Mm. They go, we took a picture of a baby every day. Look, brrr, look at it going through time. People have a lot of commitments to doing that. I can't be they? bothered. I'll do it day one, picture of baby. Day two, oh, that baby's gone. My <laughs> week, I'm not doing a picture of it. <laughs> Can't be asked. What kind of personality does that? Because a lot of people do it now. A very they? ordered one. I mean, mm. since I've been on the intermittent fasting, I've become a bit more orderly, I think. In what ways? I don't know. All right, all right. I didn't drink coffee late at night. Oh, yeah. Orderly. I've like, got more of a world view. That's what I've got. <laughs> I've got a world view because I'm so hungry. <laughs> I'll have to think about, okay, when you're eating? Tomorrow. Right. Okay. Keep it together, Russ. Keep it together. You're intermittent fasting. And I will say this is a medium size Avco top. Yep. Not that I'm advertising Avco insurance if such a thing still exists because it's from 1986. Uh, I feel like I don't look all sort of like Jimmy Five Bellies or something. I uh, look like a, a slender lad. It's worked. It's worked. I think I even said, predicted a couple of weeks ago, Russell, you will lose weight during this diet. Hang about. <laughs> Dream Weaver. <laughs> all right. Norwich v Watford. Ben Foster. Come on. Pookie scored. Mention him i take back my remarks about norwich that was unkind to Good. say Norwich. We, we did have a bit of press back on that did we yeah. i'm sorry norwich of course you're uh, who cares he was joking just it's to let a joke because the person in the tweet i know it said thanks gareth trues for your support <laughs> and i thought i yeah, was not... it's nice but i thought ah oh, maybe i should tell him that russell was just i'm joking. joking i don't i'm not like a, against people for being from norwich sometimes i just say things to entertain myself or yeah. others but i don't want to hurt no it's more of a comment wasn't it on the idea that if norwich uh live in this kind of reality of being a perpetual yo-yo team mm. like how the fans and the club take it as seriously as everyone else whereas of course they do it's just a comment on isn't it interesting that that seems to keep happening it was stupid of me <laughs> watford will do better if they wear that red kit more they're more vibrant right they're away kit it gives them a bit more i think right that's my prediction who riddle me this maybe i had a new predictor that would be interesting if we look back at the end of the season and they've got a better away record. Remember to do that, Jim. Make a note. <laughs> I like can't remember to watch a game. <laughs> or you not a score. To lean forward into the microphone. <laughs> I've been leaning. Yeah, no, you're doing well at that, <laughs> actually, mate. Did you want to marry Ben Foster? Or is he yeah, actually, finally. That's the first person I fancied a long time. Really? Yeah. You fancy Foster? Well, yeah. I'll text him. I'll tell him you fancy Thanks. Him. It's not going to make this awkward I don't at all. Know if that should be your next yeah. text. <laughs> What's the next one? Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on, ben. You're welcome around any time. Do you want me to come on your podcast? All of those. Don't mention things from 20 years ago when complimenting a person. No. Uh, well, it would be a compliment for me. And uh, what about that bit oh, where? Yeah. What about that bit where you went? Yeah, I don't care what anyone don't says. Care. I think Sarah Marshall's good, and everyone likes just a bit of a laugh and to relax. Didn't they? <laughs> I, could, I saw your face change. Like. No, hang on, what are you reducing this film to? But also, I don't think that Sarah Marshall's subject to a lot of scrutiny. It's <laughs> <laughs> a long like time ago, it's a pretty light-hearted artifact. Uh, my other ongoing things, I like it when Lineker speaks Spanish. Oh, that, that was brilliant, that, wasn't it? He does it... There was Jermaine Genus Genus said afterwards, oh, you're showing off a bit there. And then Lineker com comes back at him and said, no, oh, I'm just trying to make him feel welcome. Oh, and I thought, is Lineker kind of joking and in on a joke with Genus there? Or was he like being kind of a little bit put out by Genus's comment? Buena suerte. And I was like, I, I tell you what, I want to be able to speak Spanish. It, I want to learn it. He speaks it really well. well you speak Italian really well, don't not you? Not really well, but I can get away with it. Oh. What about the word issue? Maybe it'll improve it. Will it? I suppose it's what it is. I've got <laughs> such command of language that I think I should be able to tell it how to sound. <laughs> you should be that way. Son maximum. Um, all right, Villa v Everton. Very good set pieces. Yep. From Villa. Yep. Very good set pieces. That's proper analysis. That one where there was the header, where Mings headed it down. Mm. Mings, Ings. <laughs> Mings, Ings. <laughs> They'll be all right this season, won't they, Villa? Definitely. They They've might be the West Ham. I'll start to worry mm. a bit about West Ham. <laughs> What's Benitez doing? Raising people Benitez. from the dead. <laughs> Benitez. What's Benetton doing? <laughs> Rondon, back. Uh, it's interesting to Townsend, see. Townsend, back. I mean, the, Where are they gone? Well, the Townsend thing, I mean, he didn't go anywhere. He was at was Crystal Palace? Palace for many years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I didn't sort of remember him. I didn't. I mean, he was, he was one of Palace's stuff. best players, definitely. Was, stuff was happening. He yeah, was he there. scored he many, many submerged. good goals. No, but I think the thing with uh, Benitez is he had him at Newcastle and, and he was a big fan of his then. So he's bringing back people who he trusts, ultimately. Bring it back to me. 
bring it back. <laughs> and the same with Rondon, although Rondon, I think, went to China. I think he did. And he, he's come back. Bring him back to me. Did he go to China with Ben? Because didn't Benny Tess go to China and all? Yeah, I don't know if they went to the same team. I actually don't know. It's big that. country, big country, big world. Yeah. But ultimately, he's bringing back players, players that he trusts. <laughs> and he, hasn't, he doesn't have any budget. That's the thing, is that Everton have gone from spending as much as Man City to to spending almost nothing like it's they're, so they're it's all free transfers and because it's because they've gone and blown it it's all. It's like a fairy story. It's like West Ham, forty five million on like Anderson, yeah. and then like no, he can't afford twenty five million on Lingard. Just let him go back to United and score up against you and break your well, heart. Apparently, Lingard refused to go back oh. to West Ham. That was that was what I was reading. Is that you know it was an option. It's just he didn't. I want don't to want to do and it. You could say the fact that he's back in the United team, even you, as a sub, but he is scoring again for United. Vindicated. Maybe it's being vindicated. Okay, yeah. I'll just forget my feelings. All right. Well, that was the end of my breakdown. Should we listen to the rest of those um, jingles, Jangle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll play some. There's a few things, things we have some? not talked about. Oh, right, we will talk about all your things. We won't. We will not leave nothing on the in the on the gym yeah. in the gym on the table. Play some of these jingles of Sai. If the boys haven't done enough, I'll whip them. I'm whipping them for that tonight. That's good. You can use that safe, and you could have used that just then. Like Jen could be. That could be Jen. Could be Ron Atkinson. You chose the right Ron Atkinson quote to use. Yeah, like that's. Mm, uh, like we could. Like if the boys that I'll whip them, but I ain't whipping them for that. That's that could be Jen if you're antagonised by us. That's a good jingle. What else, Jen? Well, if Dennis Burke can't play in the snow, he, he wouldn't leave any footprints. That's very poetic and beautiful, isn't it? Mm. It's gentle. That's because size an Arsenal fan. He's trying to hark back to a time when Arsenal had. Well, you know. Right, so what, what else? Let's have Football some... is nice. I really believe it's fantastic. Uh, Russell and uh, Gareth, ball boys, a ball boy, the ball man's Two lads who know uh, nothing about football, but uh, yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> That's one of the ones where Connor Moore did it with a weird bit in the middle. Yeah, what was the yeah. bit in the middle? Ball boys, ball boys. I don't know, that was me, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't really know what you were saying. It's difficult to know, but there's some jingles. Go on, Gal, get everything off your chest that's been worrying you. Well, look. Uh, what are they, predictions, future weavings? Uh, it's more Spurs, Kane, what on earth's going on with Kane? It looks worrying, it, doesn't it? It, it? It's amazing. Like I, I, I was listening to something the other day. Um, I think it was Don Hutchinson who was talking about the fact that he knows that that deal to Man City was on. It was happening. It was agreed. 130 million. It was only like last minute hitch something happened man city pulled out maybe because of wages or something he said the deal was happening kane was going in his mind he'd already made that transition he'd made the move to man city and obviously you know we were saying i think last week that he's still scoring for england and stuff and he seems committed to spurs but the fact is he's not scoring i think this is the first time in ages where he hasn't scored in like the first four games he's making love to a husband that he no longer love like it's like he's making love to a husband that you no longer love when he's got another future husband to make love to that he wants to make love to. That's how it is. He can go through the motions, but his mind is in the sky blue husband, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to frame it in terms of husbands? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could say wives, but then I thought, nah, husbands. But isn't that interesting? That I mean, you know, a lot of the analysis has been about how deep he's playing. Um, how deep is your play? <laughs> too <Sorry>. deep, much <laughs> too deep. Can't get in the scoring positions. <laughs> I really need to know. And I, and I heard <clears throat> someone else talking. I think Michael Richards maybe talking about the fact that he um, he almost bears the responsibility of the whole Spurs side on his shoulder, and therefore he's not only trying to score the goals but set them up too. And that hence why he's playing playing so deep, like but in a cartoon where you're managing a hotel. And he's like, you sort of pretend you're the porter and then you put a different hat on and a moustache and you're the bellboy and then you deliver this thing to the room. It's a cartoon. It's probably the Beano. Yeah. Right, yeah. That's Kane. He's trying to set up the goal and he's running back. He's being in goal. Yes. Then he's running to the bench, Ronaldo style, managing the team. He's trying to be everyone. Yes. But he's in his mind, everyone. he's with another husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But isn't that like, I, I was thinking a bit like what you said about um, Arsenal the other week where you said like, you know, maybe this is the last time we even 
talk about Arsenal in the context of like a top six club or something. Maybe Arsenal will be kind of history in that sense. Mm. I wonder how we'll look back. Is like, is this going to be an incredibly defining time for Harry Kane? Like, are we going to look back in a few seasons' time when he hasn't got that move, when no one wants to pay that money for him when he's 29, 30? And he, he never... Obviously, I hope this doesn't happen because he's an incredible player. But... Um, I just, I just wonder: is this going to be, is this going to change Harry Kane forever? I think the most likely outcome is that he leaves in the January window right. because, like, if you think about it, is now if his overall governing vision for himself as a human being is I want to leave, mm. even though he has been temporarily curtailed in the pursuit of that, something deep in him is like, no, he's not going to be able to. Yep. It's, it's untenable. It's, it's deep, deep emotional levels. Right now, let's do this. Like, should we do our prediction? Oh, is there anything yes. else you want to say? If we no, no, that? that's fine. That's you sure? Fine. No, get everything well, off your chest. I suppose last thing Go is on. Chelsea. Uh, they just look an in- unstoppable I, force. Who's going to stop them? And it, this is why this weekend the Man City Chelsea game is absolutely huge. Because if Chelsea win that, you feel like that's it. They're yeah, gonna, there's too much power. Yeah. There's too much power too coming good. out of the bridge. That they even played Kepa in goal the other day, and they still won three 0 Well, he is a good goalkeeper. I mean, he's very <laughs> expensive. I was wanted to ask Ben Foster about that actually, like sort of you know, like that sort of whole Mendy, Kepa, Frank Lampard tri- yeah. triangle of well, like. Kepa was an example of a keeper that was brought on to save penalties, wasn't he? Yeah, like, he was that. And what yeah. about wouldn't he like he wouldn't come off one time? That's right. Yeah. Who was managing then? Uh, sorry, that was, sorry, I yeah. think it was. Just, I ain't coming off. Yeah. I'm staying here. Oh, that's a heavy diss. Yeah. But there's a tension there. The, the goalkeeper chat's good, isn't it? I think you get a lot more out of the keepers because they, they operate as like a single unit or as a, they're, they're almost... They're playing their own sport. They're, playing their they're own sport. surveying. They're, yeah. they're, they're a drummer. Mm. They're a drummer in a band, aren't they? They're yeah. the drummers of a team. They are. I imagine their analysis of the way a team functions, of the way a club is run, of a way... Yeah, it must be very diff- different to the other... But I know, can't believe no goalkeeper team. managers. That's weird. Well, Nuno is. Nuno is a former keeper. Is he? Yeah. That's Spurs. At Spurs? Yeah. Ah, he's a former keeper. Former keeper. For our new item, Jeepers Keepers, where we discuss keepers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so quick predictions. Yep. Speed chess predictions speed, for, speed, speed, speed. for the games coming up. Okay. Uh, Chelsea v Man City. Uh, uh, oh, that's too, you're taking too long. Too long. Okay. Chelsea 1-0 is two, my prediction. 2-1 Chelsea. All right. Uh, Man United v Aston Villa. My, my prediction, 2-all. Your prediction? 1-1. One, one. Uh, Everton v Norwich. 3-1 Everton, my prediction. 2-0 Everton. I mean, I've got the advantage of them going first. Leeds United v West Ham United. The objective, he goes out the window. West Ham 3, Leeds 1. Yours? Uh, 2-1 West Ham. Yes. I believe more in your predictions than mine, look. <laughs> uh, Leicester versus Burnley. 1-0 uh, Leicester. Because you're going first for a bit. I, 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 oh, no, sorry, I've put it the wrong way down. 1-0, 1-0. Sorry about this. Sorry, everyone listening to this, that you have to listen. I think Leicester are going to win. Although they've had a little shake start 2-1. Uh, Watford in Newcastle now because of Ben Foster. I'm all biased in because I know Steve Bruce is going through so yeah. much. 2-0 Watford. Y- yeah. Can I have the same? Of course you can. No, no. Brentford, Liverpool. Money Ooh. where your mouth is with your Renny ready made n- new Lukaku. How do you really feel? Because I think it, my prediction is three nil Liverpool. It's always three nil Liverpool. They can't keep winning three nil. I think it'll be tighter. I'm, mate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my neck on the line and say one one. If you're right, Gareth, it's gonna be great. <laughs> that, like you, I, w- I will love it if you. No, I won't love it if you're right. Do I not like that if you uh, win? Oh, fuck it. Do I not like that? Do I not like that when Gareth predicts the future? All right, and then to Sunday's game, Southampton v Wolves. Oh, I think Wolves will win, and I'm predicting that they will. It's just, so I'm thinking 2 0 away win. I'm going to say 1 1. 1 1. Arsenal, Spurs. Oh, wow. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think that I think that Tottenham will win. I think Kane will score. And I want you to remember this, Gal. Yep. I think it's going to be uh, a 2 Nil away win. I'm going one nil Arsenal again. One nil to the Arsenal again. Let's see if this comes back to haunt me. <laughs> Palace v Brighton. I oh, think. Oh, Derby. That's a Derby, isn't it? Yeah, they see that as a Derby. Eagle, Seagull, Derby. Yeah. I think that Brighton's going to win because they're playing sort of amazing, aren't they? And they are. Graham Potter. <laughs> With his long, but his beard that gets longer every week. I know that's how growth that's, yeah, works. Yeah, everyone's beard. But what gets I mean is he's week. choosing not to cut it. He's choosing right, not he's to not trim trimming. it. No. He's not trimming. Like how far While is he going? While we're winning, I ain't trimming. <laughs> they call me Potter, Potter. <laughs> um, 
to nil. Uh, I'll go for Brighton. It. I'll go. We'll keep, oh no! For... Predicted too many two nils. I've only predicted two nil the whole way through. Well, I'll have to be right at some point. I'm going to go for one one. I'm very boring. You've gone these. for one one. Oh, you're take. You're stifling it. You're the Mourinho of predictions. You've parked the bus. You've parked the prediction bus. <laughs> Get back aboard the prediction bus. All right. So we've got Jared, Jen. We must treasure and cherish these predictions by Jove. There they are. I'll put them somewhere them sacred because that's uh, let's hand that as if it's something important. Right. Okay. Well, it seems like you know. Look, give us a review. Watch us on YouTube and subscribe to that channel. Watch the rest of the work that me and Gareth do. Perhaps listen to my other podcast, Under the Skin and Above the Noise on Luminary. This is our free podcast. That we're we very do. much drawn to ninety minutes, aren't we? With these podcasts. Well, we automatically do ninety minutes. We automatically do. We put on our shirts and we know we're in this for ninety. Yeah. No fifteen minute break in the middle, unless you think of like when Foster was on, where we was having a little rest. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't resting. I was focused. No. I like looking at the inside of his vehicle. He was yeah. in. It was amazing looking. I didn't want to mention it because they were bring it up. But yeah. it looked like a spaceship. Yeah. Ben Foster's in a sort of a beautifully well, clad you, spaceship. He wants to be mates with you, so you can have a look at all his vehicles. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I Shall imagine I? he's got more than one vehicle. Of course he has. <clears throat> Although, what about how Kante on Gala <clears throat> drives a Mini Cooper? <laughs> I like him. Uh, he's so Everyone likeable. likes him. Everyone he's humble. Likes him. Everyone likes him. What about our Cantona? I lived in what you might call the normal house of a, an accountant, <laughs> even at the height of his career when he's coming um, out for that thing. Not a very well paid accountant. An accountant that's not bothering to be corrupt and double cook the books. A legit accountant's house. Like yeah. in that documentary, you see Cantona. There was loads of good stuff in that. We'll continue to watch that. We'll continue mm. to do football reporting. We'll continue to make predictions. We'll continue to look for the heart and soul and discuss it the, to um, metabolize, metastasize, chew through and grow the uh, deep truths within football. Thank Thanks, uh, Lorenzo, for doing the beautiful music. Thanks, Sai, for those jingles you gave us. Thanks, that cartoon lad who said he wanted a few hundred quid to do those drawings. And I thought, no, we can't afford a budget yet because this is, uh, is uh, not yet monetized. Free, we'll have to find some sort of sponsor because at the moment our sponsor is a sport pesser, a betting firm for Hull, who probably still don't sponsor Hull no more. No. And Avco, an insurance firm probably based in Romford, <laughs> probably went out of business in like you know Black Wednesday when John Major was still Prime Minister. <laughs> There's some references for you. <laughs> I hope I, I listen. I like people are reviewing this in Australia, all around the world. We love your five star reviews. We love your tweets. Give us a follow. Stay in touch with us. Particularly, you know, Gareth. You can communicate with Gareth. So I didn't know what we said about Norwich, and I'm, I apologise for that. I was only making a <laughs> Is that it? Is football is nice. It is nice, mate. Mm.